Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessing upon us tonight as we gather here together and to share one with another the word of God, the word you've given us, and a time, a season of prayer. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, and we feel ourselves moved uh, to pray one for another. Intercessory prayer is important. You've taught it to us in the scripture, and we pray you'll bless our time in prayer this evening. Thank you for these who've joined us in the Fellowship Hall of our church and those who've joined with us online. Bless each and every one of them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 138. <clears throat> psalm 138 is a psalm of David. <clears throat> and if uh, your Bible has titles over the psalms, it probably has a title similar to this, Give Thanks to the Lord. This is a psalm of thanksgiving. And the idea of David's thankfulness uh, shows up a couple of different times in the psalm in verses one and two. He'll say in verse one, I give thanks, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name. For your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. David's heart is full of gratitude. Notice what he says in verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you ever feel that way? You preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. David has felt God's protection in his life. God showed up and watched over him during a time when he felt at risk and danger. Then the psalm ends with verse 8. This is my text, verse 8. <clears throat> and um, we will think together about the certainty of future goodness here. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Some translate that first line, the Lord will complete his purpose for me, which is a good translation. <clears throat> or the Lord will perfect his purpose for me. The idea is the same. Continuing verse 8. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. <clears throat> Questions that come to my mind as I approach this verse of Scripture under the heading of certainty of future goodness uh, are uh, several, including, is it possible for Christians to face the future with the certainty that there will be good for us? Now, I don't know about you, but things really do feel like they're crumbling. I don't want to spend the time to, tonight complaining or identifying what you already know, but when you just you just summarize what we're watching happen in our society today. It just looks like everyone's taking stupid pills and, and you wonder what in the world is going on here. And then the next question is, are we going to be okay? And that's the question I want to, I want to consider with you tonight. Are we facing a future that we can be assured is a good future as God's people? The title, The Certainty of Future Good. Three ideas that I want to portray, share with you out of this verse are as follows. Number one, the Christian certainty and the providential goodness of God. The Christian certainty and the providential goodness of God. Number two, the guarantee of God's providential goodness. <clears throat> and number three, the Christian's response to this truth and promise. Let's consider these three ideas. First, the Christian certainty and the providential goodness of God. Listen to what David says in verse 8. At the beginning of verse 8, <clears throat> 
Notice the idea of certainty here as it relates to God and his providential goodness. He writes, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Notice a number of things highlighting different words there. Uh, who will uh, do what needs to be done in my life as I face the future? Verse 8 says, the Lord will. Is that good news? The Lord will. Uh, and there's certainty in this sentence by the words, the Lord will, not the Lord may, the Lord will possibly could but the lord will there's no chance he won't <laughs> he will the lord's going to do it there's certainty in it he will do it but what will he do verse eight the first part of that verse is he will fulfill his purpose for me let me ask you a question is god's purpose a good purpose do you scare God's will? Are you scared of God's will? <clears throat> I want to tell you something. I'm ashamed to tell you this. But <clears throat> as a teenager, um, I think I was scared to death. Some of you may understand this. I was scared to death to tell God I would do anything he wanted me to do. Has anybody ever felt that way? Because you were scared to give God permission because you weren't sure what God would ask you to do. I heard a story of a young lady uh, who, who told the Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and I'd go anywhere in the world you want me to go to do that, except I won't go to anywhere where there are large snakes. She ended up being a missionary in the Amazon. And I heard that story, and I thought, see, you can't trust God. I'm ashamed of that because the God who is nothing but good cannot choose anything but that which is good. This is good news. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. You are never safer than when you say, Lord, your will be done in my life. You are in, I haven't heard the commercial of Allstate. You're in good hands with Allstate. You remember that commercial. That wasn't true. But it is true you're in good hands with God. If your life is in his hands, you're safe with him. That is the Christian certainty. It is found in the providential goodness of God. I can trust him. I can surrender to him. I can yield to him with all of my heart and know with certainty that it's going to be good. Second point, the guarantee of God's providential goodness. What guarantees that providential goodness that I think verse 8 gives us as we contemplate the future? How do I know God's going to do what is good? Notice verse 8 again in the second line. You're, and I'm reading the ESV, so it says it this way. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. When, when the Apostle Paul, at the end of Romans 8, decided to write the most assuring, confident, uh, undergirding, comforting thing he could think of, what did he write about? In verses 35 through 39 in Romans 8, he wrote about the love of God. And he, what, I think it's the most remarkable statement on the assurance, the security we find in the love of God. He says, can, can life or death, things present, things to come, things high, things low, uh, any created thing, any spiritual entity... Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And when he wrote that, he meant to comfort those Roman believers that you can be assured 
you can be assured that because God loves you, that love will make sure your future is going to be good. He calls that love a steadfast love. Never wavers. It never goes on vacation. It never that. takes a day off. It endures, he says, forever. That's the guarantee. God will never stop loving you and stop loving me. Isn't that good news? The Christian certainty is found in his providential goodness that he will providentially intervene in my life to fulfill his purpose for me, which is good and nothing can stop him. How do I know? What's the guarantee of that? Is that his steadfast love is the genesis and the cause and the launching pad for that providential goodness and that steadfast covenantal love endures forever. Third, what is our response to that? First of all, I think there is a response to that. Everything God does is intended for us to respond to it. By the way, I think that's what the thanksgiving was about in the early part of the chapter. David is thanking the Lord. That's a response. God's been good to him. God's taken care of him. And he gives thanks to the Lord. And I, I have often thought about it in my own life. How good has God been to me? Hey, let me ask you, how good's God been to you? How, how good was God to you today? And you say, well, God didn't show up today. How do you know? How do you know God was incognito? He just didn't tell you he was there. But I think if you put on the glasses to see what God was really doing, you might see that his angels were, were watching over you today. You just didn't know about it. You just went to work, had lunch, did this, did that, went to Walgreens, went home. Or came to church at night, not knowing God was being really good to you today. Right? So every day I always end with, in, in my prayers, that God, I'm sorry, I haven't thanked you enough today. I want to rectify that before I go to sleep. I want to thank you for what you've done for me today. Things I don't even know about, thank you for what you've done for me today. But, we should respond to God's goodness, promise, and truth. What is David's response? Third, third line, third sentence in verse 8. This seems like it takes a different turn. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Wait, he's already said the Lord. He, he's certain the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. He's guaranteed that in the steadfast love of God, which endures forever. Now he responds to it by doing what? Praying. The third line is a prayer. Do you see that? He's talking to God. He's talking to God. If you know God is certain to help you out, does that mean you don't have to pray? That's the reason to pray. I've been asked so many times, if God decides who gets saved, why do we send people around the world with the gospel? And my response is, God decides who gets saved. That's why we send people around the world with the gospel. Because somebody's going to get saved. When God decides to save them, he's going to save them. That's why we go and preach the gospel. So it doesn't mean we don't do that. It means we do do that. If you know God's going to take care of you, pray with confidence and ask God to do what he said he would do. Listen to what he says. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The prayerful plea is do not forsake. And the humble admission is the work of your hands. What or who is the work of God's hands? We are. Who's he talking about? Don't forsake the work of your hands. Uh, you, do you remember? You may not. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you from Ephesians 2. After the Baptist a text, verses 8 and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing by works. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should vote. And then verse 10. Don't leave out verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus 
for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How did you become you? How did you get saved? How did you become a child of God? How did you become a new creature in Christ? God made you that. You're his workmanship. The word is poema, it, from which we get the word poem. God has created a beautiful rendition of you when he made you. You're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Here David is saying, do not forsake the work of your hands. I am who I am because you made me this way. Don't abandon me. Don't forsake me. And I know you won't because you will fulfill your purpose for me. For your steadfast love, O oh Lord, endures forever. I think that the Christian life is an active life. It is not a lazy life. If you think the Christian life's a lazy life, repent. God didn't save you to make you a lazy Christian. Shame on you. And I, when I run into people say, well, I don't have to go to church. I'm saved by grace. You, know, you don't understand what grace is. Grace is not only unmerited favor, but it's the power of God and it's sufficient to make you do what you ought to do. I need to be active. I need to be involved. How do I do that? I do that by resting on what God promised me in his providential goodness and feeling the power of the certainty of it guaranteed by his love, which elicits from me a response to pray and seek to do his will, depending upon him as the work of his hands. The certainty of future goodness. I want to apply this just briefly in a statement or two. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm scared to death of the future. I think if God doesn't show up, this country has a very dark future ahead of it. And I think it's healthy to be scared a little bit. More folks would show up for prayer. If we knew how dangerous this time is, we'd show up for prayer. God, we need you. Just lollygagging around. We don't need to pray. That's not that important. Really. I think we ought to be crying out to God. But here's my point. I don't want us to get panicked. God does not give us a spirit of faith. Fear, Paul will tell young Timothy, the power and love and a sound mind. We need to get busy. We need to put on the armor of God and we need to go to work. Let's do what we can with the confidence that God has given us a good future and his love is steadfast and enduring. So let's pray and let's serve. May God help us as we do that. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that we will not cower in fear for what is to come. We are not ignorant of what could happen. But nor will we be driven by the fear of what could happen. Heavenly Father, we pray tonight as we have prayed for decades, many of us. We yield ourselves wholly and completely to you. We say, as we have said so many times before in prayer, your will be done in our lives. Lead us, guide us, direct us, send us, empower us, and help us to be good servants of your kingdom. We take the words of your servant David tonight, and we confess in this final prayer, that we know for sure that you will fulfill your purpose for us. 
that your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever, causing that providential goodness to come to pass in our lives. And, and we beg of you to be with us, stand by us, empower us, accompany us, strengthen us, and thus not forsake the work of your hands in our lives. Until our day is done, our service is ended, and it's your time for us to come home to heaven. We pursue you in faith and love and obedience. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.